one of the basic truths that we Christians know is that Christ is the true treasure. I think that's very basic for us. And yet, it is probably one of the truths that our lives often confound at best and deny at worst. This I say because our lives often show that other things are more important than Christ. Our priorities would show that or would, would, would you know, demean Christ and our lives somehow is not showing that this is how supreme Christ is. Many times our lives are consumed not on the things of Christ, but on the things of this world. I chose this one today instead of continuing in our series on uh, tulip or Calvinism uh, for the purpose that I want to use our first service here in Grand Villa to remind us of our treasure and as the Lord Jesus Christ. In these two verses, Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24, we are somewhat given a summary of the essence of Christianity. That is, not merely doing, not merely doing, but treasuring. Not merely serving, but worship. In this passage, we are told we are not to boast we are not to boast on the treasures of this world, but on God. Thus, my title for this message is Christ, the true treasure. Christ, the true treasure. And yes, it is in the objective, although in our, in our um, graphic, it's Christ, our treasure. But I am actually untitling it Christ, the treasure. And the reason why I put it in the objective sense is because whether you treasure Christ or not, it doesn't change the fact that Christ is the treasure. Jeremiah was basically, was basically called to, to be a prophet of the southern kingdom, Judah. So the, the kingdom of Israel was already divided into northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And Judah was called to be a prophet to the southern kingdom. His prophetic career started at the, mid, at the middle of the reign of King Josiah. And if you remember, King Josiah was actually a good king. So he started at the middle of the career of King Josiah all the way on the time when they were exiled to Babylon. King Josiah actually made the reforms um, to the nation of Judah, especially the temple was again reconstructed. There was reading of God's word again. It was a, a revival, worship, spiritual revival of the nation of Judah. However, before King Josiah was King Manasseh. Manasseh was probably one of the worst, if not the worst king of Judah. And so it was in the time of Manasseh that God was actually dead set already to discipline Judah as well. So that after King Josiah, God just picked up where he left until eventually he exiled Judah as well to Babylon. In fact, God knew very well that the idolatry of Judah, idolatry of Judah was so deep. It was so deeply ingrained in them. So that God somewhat in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6, six to 11, uh, told Judah that you are worse than your sister, the northern Israel, because you have already saw that they were idolatrous, and you already saw what I did to them. They were routed by Assyria. 
But here you are following the example of your sister. And in that sense, God says, you're worse than the northern kingdom. These idolatrous practices of Judah have resulted to a host of problems. Social injustice. Uh, they were not taking care of their widows. And they were even abusing their poor. Not only social injustice, they have abusive leaders from their prophets to their priests to their elders. They have abusive leaders. And worse, they were guilty of syncretistic worship. You know, they worship on the temple, but they thought it is okay to also worship the idols of other nations. They also worship on the temples of Baals and thought it was okay. So we see all of these, uh, the host of problems, and if you are a fixer, you know, for those of us who are problem solvers, and you see all those problems, you will ask yourself, what is the root of this problem? You'll be overwhelmed by a lot of problems here. You will find yourselves, what is the root of all these problems? Now, while Judah would surely insist that they knew their God, like us, even when we are sinning or, you know, we will continue to insist that we know our God. Jeremiah 9, 23 to 24 somewhat explains to us the heart of the problem. When they refused, essentially, to yield to the three messages of God, God gave three messages in the book of Jeremiah. When God was still calling them to repentance, God said, repent. When they came to the point where God knew exactly, I, I will discipline you. He was dead set to discipline them. God said, submit to Babylon. Don't fight against Babylon. It will just lead to your destruction. It is okay. Go to Babylon. I will take care of you there. And then the third message of God in the book of Jeremiah is that even if I disciplined you, and I brought you into a foreign country, continue to cling to me because I am a God of steadfast love. I have not forgotten my promise to you, my covenant promise to you, and so I will bring you back to Jerusalem. But in all of these three messages of God to Judah, they all resisted. They resisted this message of God. And again, Jeremiah 29, 20, 9, 23 to 24, for God to exhort them to know him tells us that Judah did not really know their God. Which here in this passage, when we talk about knowing God, it is best displayed when we worship or when we treasure, when we treasure God. So how easy could it be, not only for Israel, but for us, God's people today, to assume that we know God and no longer can to examine if God is still the treasure of our hearts. And yet, mind you, it is, I would propose, the most practical thing to do. For us as a church, the most practical thing to do is to always make sure that God is still our treasure. So here's my big idea this morning. Nothing can be more practical than treasuring Christ, for it determines the strength of our obedience to God. Nothing can be more practical than treasuring Christ, for it determines the strength of our obedience to God. Well, Christ is the treasure, whether you treasure him or not, but we should treasure Christ first because of righteousness. It is righteous if we treasure nothing but Christ. And secondly, let's treasure Christ for our own sake. Our lives, our churches, our relationships, our families, our work will be a mess. We will encounter a lot of problems 
if we fail to treasure Christ. Now, let me give you an example to that. Do you know that emptiness of heart is um, so expensive to finance? Emptiness of heart is so expensive to finance. Even if you don't need a thing, you want to buy to spice up something, to spice up your life. Because you're so empty. And you keep on buying something, although you do not need that one. And it's what you need, but you actually do not. The problem is really the emptiness of the heart. Here are my three points for this message. Treasure not your treasure. We are not supposed to treasure whatever we have, however valuable they might be, because they are not as valuable as Christ. So the second point today is treasure Christ. But if we really treasure Christ, then we display it in our lives. That leads us to our third point. Treasure Christ with your life. Treasure not your treasure. Treasure Christ and treasure Christ with your life. Treasure not your treasure. How easy is it for us to draw our words on what we have? We think we are important because this is our work. We think we are a valuable person because we have a car. We always try to draw our worth in that which we have. But we are commanded here in verse 23 of Jeremiah 9 by the Lord himself saying, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. Those words are counterintuitive, aren't they? If the most precious thing that a wise have is wisdom, why not prize wisdom above all? That's supposed to be the way you should think, right? Same goes with the mighty and the rich. Let not the wise, the mighty, and the rich boast on the very thing that would, that's supposed to define them. The reason why they're called mighty is because they have might. The reason why they're called rich people is because they have riches. The reason why they're called powerful people is because they have power. So the power, riches, and might have defined these people but then God said, do not boast of that which defines you. It is so human, though, for us in our corruption to draw our boast on something that gives us value in the culture that we're living. In fact, we work hard to gain this thing so that we will be valuable in this world. Or, in other words, we will be important. We want to be a manager so that we will no longer be called boy, but sir. We want to be important, don't we? It is obvious then that this passage deals with value. We boast on that which we value the most. But if we consider verse 24, and God's exhortation in verse 24 is boasting in the Lord. Let him will boast, boast that he knows me. We understand then that the problem is not boasting. Because we are boastful. The problem lies on our ability to discern what is truly valuable. This is the problem here. Our problem is we boast on the wrong things. This somewhat paints what sin is in the book of Jeremiah, by the way. Valuing that which is not truly valuable above him who is truly valuable, namely God. Listen to what shocked God 
Not that God was surprised of this, but to show that this is the most foolish thing to him. The most foolish thing to God is found in Jeremiah 2. And I want to read verses 9 to the, down to verse 13. Prior to verse 9, God said, I planted you, I watered you, I, I cared for you, but you never really bore for, fruit. Verse 9 of Jeremiah chapter 2 reads, Therefore, I still contend with you, declares the Lord, and with your children's children, I will contend. Verse 10 is the reason. For cross to the coast of Cyprus and see, or send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. God said, this did not even happen to other countries, but this is happening to you. Verse 11, has a nation changed its gods, even, they, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Verse 12, be appalled of heavens at this, be shocked, be utterly desolate. This is what shocked God. This is what is unimaginable to God. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for their themselves broken cisterns that can hold no water look at what god said here i am shocked at this i have been a flowing of water to you and i have satisfied you but then you exchanged me for a broken cistern that would not even give you a drop of water we realize then that sin has so corrupted our ability to appraise the true value of things because we are unable to see the value of God. It's only when we know the value of God that we know the value of things. And the problem with valuing things more than God is that we do not really know God is, who God is. If we know what the real gold is, it would be shocking if we exchange it for the fake one. Judah exchanged God for earthly things, for idols, because they did not know God. In a sense, God was shocked at their blindness. Humanly speaking, God was shocked at their foolishness. And clearly, God did not want Judah to value things that are not even comparable to him. The church, our knowledge, our power, our riches, our success, our successes in life, as important as they seem to be because they gave us value in the eyes of the people around us. How many of us, whose immediate family, relatives, their view of us has changed because, because we became someone else? But as valuable as they seem to be, they will never be more valuable than God. How can these things be more valuable than him who gave us these things? But here's the problem. We will only boast on the things of this world if we do not know God. Because if we truly know the eternal God, Highlight eternal God, we will know the nature of these things. Wisdom, might, riches, which is earthly. Earthly cannot be more valuable than him who is eternal. Even in our church, we could prize our knowledge. We could prize our theology. We could hold our heads high because... We are proud of our ways and oblivious to the fact that these things have taken the place of Christ. 
And by the way, it is not that we do not rejoice on these things. We rejoice in our theology. We rejoice in our ways and the things that God has taught us. But we want to make it sure that our rejoicing on these things is always grounded on Christ. This should be the right time to jump to our second point. Treasure Christ. Treasure not your treasure. Treasure Christ. A, a person who has a deep understanding, a deep understanding on Christ, finds this, or finds treasuring Christ, is simple yet profound. He understands that knowing the value of Christ could be the most important thing that he has. Thus, he does not blindly treasure Christ, or in other words, I would treasure Christ because it's always been said, treasure Christ, of oh, do you, I do not know and I do not understand what does it mean to treasure Christ. He does not blindly treasure Christ, but he treasures Christ because he knows that nothing is more valuable than Christ. Verse 24, it reads, But let him who boast, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. Here the Lord brought our attention to the reality that is, he is greater than any earthly treasure we have. At some point, relationship can be more important than Christ to us. At some point, it seemed like our work, we feel like it's more important than Christ. We can be confused at some point, but not God. Very unapologetic, God called Judah to boast in him. He knew exactly God would never have a confusing times where would he would feel like, am I really greater than all these things? He knew that it is so righteous for him to call his creations to treasure him alone. The word Lord here is Yahweh, the covenant name of God, which we know already the first time we, we've read of this word, of this name of God is in Genesis chapter 2, which I really felt at all times, that it is a fitting place to understand the beauty of this name of God. Chapter 2 follows chapter 1, where we found God speaking things into existence. Chapter 1 is a um, great display of this sovereign God, who clearly is greater than all his creations. But in chapter 2, from a God who is so high, infinitely high. In chapter 2, we find that this God who is holy entered into a covenant with this creation. Think about it. This God who is not obliged to enter into a covenant relationship. When he enters into a covenant relationship, if you may, he tied himself with that covenant. And why would a God do that? In chapter 2, we see that this God, who is high, went down to his creation. And entered into a covenant relationship with Adam. So we have a God who is above all his creations, and yet one who enters into a covenant with his people. If you may, as theologians would always assert, God is transcendent, yet imminent. He is above, yet he is with us. Which the scripture, by the way, used to portray the beauty and the glory of God. The beauty and the glory of God in the scripture is displayed by him being so high, and yet he goes down where his people are. Psalm 135 38 verse 5 tells us that the, the glory of God is great. And then verse 6, he gave us the reason why the glory of God is great. And this is what he says 
In Psalm 138, verse 6, For though the Lord is high, He regards the lowly. He regards the lowly. In Psalm 8, Psalm 8 actually pronounced, proclaimed the majestic name of God. In verse 1 and then in verse 8, twice in that small psalm, we are told, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And the explanation between, we read that, that David said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your hands, what is man that you are mindful of him? The, maje- not, the name of God is majestic because he is so great that he painted and he created all these things. And yet he is mindful of that little puny creation of him called man. For anyone who understands not only that he is puny in comparison to the rest of creation, but that that he deserved nothing good because he sinned against God, nothing could be more valuable to him, but to know that God chose to have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Surely, God is greater than any earthly treasure. These truths of God, sovereign yet relational, defines the knowing that God points here. Understands, that he will both boast in this, that he understands, and then he said knows. Both of these words, I believe they, they are different words that tells us a different beauty. It's not simply for semantics, di ba preach ako? I give one word and then give another word, which is just the same uh, of that word. I think this is not just semantic, but to let us see the beauty of this knowing. Understands that word there is uh, that knowledge we learn, we gain from the course of life, which we understand that those are deep knowledge. If you may, these are our realizations. You know, we have a lot of realizations and our realizations are, are deep treasures. Knows, we know that this means the experiential relational knowledge. So one thing we know here is that God was not talking about mere information, but instead certainty, sureness, and deep knowledge. This is what God is talking about here. There's certainly, there's pers- it's a personal knowledge. It's a relational knowledge. Yeah, you can search about my wife, Google her, and find an internet of information. But, but it's another thing to know her personally. When God brought us into a relationship with him, we just know that we know God. Let's put it that way. We just know that we know God. I cannot, a lot of liberal scholars who knows the scripture more than I, but they do not know God the way I know God. And the course of life only continually affirm that this is who God is. From the very beginning, I already know that God is love. And as I journey through life, through life, you know what I discover? That God is a God of love. Life will only prove these truths about God. So two things that then that we should be, we should upheld when we talk about knowing, uphold, sorry, that we should uphold when we talk about knowing God. First, we are not called by God to only know about him, but to know him. To know him personally. You see, Christian epistemology, um, what, what does it mean? It means how we know what we know. Bakit natin alam yung alam natin? At ang alam po natin ay ang patungkol sa Diyos ay hindi lang po natin ito nalalaman dahil po ay pinag-aralan natin. Alam natin na nalalaman natin patungkol sa Diyos ay alam po natin dahil sa banal na Espiritu. And that we are sure that we know God. Secondly, knowing God cannot be without knowing the truth about Him. 
knowing God cannot be without knowing the truth about him. Look at what God said here again in verse 24. But let him who boast, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices. Take note of that. Who practices. So we are dealing here with God's action or works. Who practices not just steadfast love, but also justice and righteousness in the earth to mean in his dealing with men. So God, he said that, that you know that I deal with men in steadfast love, righteousness, and justice. We are always invited by the scripture to know God through his works. And yes, one of these truths could be highlighted at a certain point, but it is not because God acted out one of his attributes in separation from the rest of who he is. God always acts in accordance with the whole of him. In other words, one attribute of God, probably steadfast love, justice or righteousness can be highlighted because of our situation. But it doesn't mean that God only acts in accordance to his justice at certain point and not of his love. In everything he does, he acts in accordance to his righteousness, justice, love, mercy, power, goodness. God is whole. The point is this. Those who truly know God, or those who truly know the Lord, are those who will embrace not just a portion of God. When we were a new church, it was a problem to us because many will come to me and say, Pastor, I know that God has changed because in the Old Testament, I saw a God who is ferocious and would kill people. But then when I go to the New Testament, I see a God who is grace, grace, grace. But that's not true. God is immutable. He does not change. He does not change. So it's not accepting a portion of God as if God can be portioned. But you have to accept the whole of God. That's where the problem is. A mere studying the word would already bring us to some point where it's so hard to reconcile things. How can God be a God of steadfast love and yet he will not leave anyone unpunished? But most importantly, if we are placed in a situation, how many of us here finds it easy to think that God is good when your life is a wreck? I counsel a brother for months who could not wrap his mind around a God who is good and yet allowed bad things to happen to his loved one. Because of their situation, to rightly view of God would have been difficult for Judah. When God called them to repent from trusting not only the gods of other nations, but for other nations, it would have been hard to know that God is righteous because of the seeming help they could get from these idols. When God was determined to exile them, it would have been hard for them to wrap their minds around the justice of God because they could not understand how their own God would allow Babylon to destroy them. When they were finally in Babylon, they were destroyed as a nation. It would have been hard to see the steadfast love of God after being destroyed by the same God. But if they knew God well, they would have submitted to God. They would have repented. They would have submitted to the discipline. And they would have clinged to the steadfast love of God even when they were disciplined. That's a very practical thing to us, right? If we know our God, when God disciplines us, we submit to his discipline because we know his God. We know his good. And while in our discipline, we don't turn our back from God because we know that God would never forget his promises to us in Christ Jesus. From a man's vantage point or sa pananaw po nating mga tao, it might be hard to understand 
God, to understand God, how can he be a God of steadfast love and yet of justice and righteousness? It is hard because I am a sinner. How then can he love me? If he's a God of justice, then he has to destroy me. How then can God be steadfast in his love? In fact, so hard that the solution of God in the book of Jeremiah, if you look at verse 25 of Jeremiah 3 and 26, God said, you know what's your problem, Judah? You are like these nations, uncircumcised in hearts. And God's solution came all the way down to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, when God said, you cannot do it on your own. Let me do this. Let me promise this to you. I will renew your heart. It's a new covenant. I will circumcise your hearts. Through the Holy Spirit, I will regenerate you so that your blind eyes, your blind hearts will finally see my beauty. But this seeming irreconcilable thing actually paints the beauty and the glory of God. What was seemingly irreconcilable, that's probably why Judah did not understand. A God abounding in steadfast love and yet in no way leave the guilty and punish was proven to be perfectly whole in the person and work of Christ who came not with the law like Moses, but came with truth and grace. This John 1, 17 and verse 18 tells us that he revealed God. But the work of the Holy Spirit of opening the eyes of our hearts to see Christ. We have personally known God. And yes, He is a God of steadfast love, justice, and righteousness. Because while we have fallen short of His righteousness and in His justice deserves His wrath, God displayed His steadfast love when he poured his very wrath for us in Christ Jesus. So for regenerated sinners like us, who now see the glory of God as in a mirror, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, that's how clear the glory of God is. There is nothing more valuable and beautiful than Christ, where the steadfast love, justice, and righteousness of God keeps each other. In Christ, we are certain God's forgiveness when we repent. In Christ, we are certain that God is our good when He disciplines us. In Christ, we are certain of our hope of full redemption, even when we are under discipline. You and I know that for saved sinners, there is nothing more beautiful and glorious than Christ. There is nothing more beautiful and glorious than Christ. Those who have known Christ and the truth of the gospel boast in Christ alone. They know that there could be no riches greater than Christ. They know that there could be no wisdom greater than Christ. They know that there could be no power greater than the gospel of Christ because riches, wisdom, and might would never promise us eternal life. Riches, might, and wisdom would never solve our greatest dilemma. How can a sinner be accepted by a holy God? That's why when Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, after he said, where is the rich, where is the wise, and where is the mighty? He then said in 1 Corinthians 1, 30-31, And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, because Christ became everything to us, let the one who boasts, Boast in the Lord. What is your boast? See, boast is not something you tell yourself. I will boast on Christ. Boast is something that will come out naturally because they occupy your heart. 
what is it that is so natural to tell people about? I know at some point of my life, I know my boast is basketball. And I hate myself for that because five minutes into a conversation, I turned the conversation about LeBron James. But if Christ occupies our heart five minutes into the conversation, turn the conversation to Christ. Because we cannot control our hearts. Our hearts controls. How then should we treasure Christ? This leads us to the third point. Treasure Christ with your life. No one truly treasure Christ if he or she could only profess it with his mouth without displaying it in his or her life. We treasure that which consumes our lives. So we can only prove that Christ is our treasure if we live for him. Look at the last part of Jeremiah 9. God said, For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. In these things I delight, declares the Lord. What this means is that the Lord calls his people to also delight in these things. Now there is ambiguity here. Questions like, these things, does it mean steadfast love, justice, or righteousness? For those who boast in the Lord. Either way, the point is clear. Those who know the Lord will delight in the things that God delight in. Now, this is how we can prove that we truly know God. I love to taste Malu, who hates coffee, by offering her coffee. And she would, all, she, she would tell me every time, you still don't know me, do you? Now, we cannot claim that we know God if we do not delight in the things that he delights in. Psalm 37 verse 4, one of your favorite verses of scripture says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, we will somehow see the force of the word delight here in this passage. As forceful as the word desires. It's a forceful thing. That's my desire. It becomes merely a wish. In Psalm, 1, Psalm 37 verse 4, the word desire is merely a wish or a request when compared to delight. This is, Psalm, this is what Psalm 37 verse 4 shows us. Delight consumes our heart in a way that we want others to delight in it. Have you ever tried it? Things that you love, things that you delight, you want people to delight in them as well. Now think of your idols. Uh, for, for basketball players here, uh, for me, I love it when others would love LeBron James as well. For our millennials, um, you love it when others would love keep up as well. Uh, When God said he delights in the things that reflects who he is, he desires that we also delight in them because it shows that we know God. Pastor James, um, we once had our coffee fellowship, and since he has been with the Presbyterian for quite some time, and I asked him, what is your attitude towards like-minded confessionals and the greater evangelicals or even our Catholic friends? And he said, particularly with people who do not believe in Jesus, he said, you know what, and then we will lock arms with them in fighting against abortion. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. Even if you're a Muslim or whatever, religion you are, if, we are, if you are fighting against abortion, against same-sex marriage, we will lock arms with them because God delights in these things. We will continue to be passionate and engage in these things. This is one, by the way, that we as a church need to grow. We begin to acknowledge now that we are a church who can be so 
inward looking and we only care for what's happening within our community to the point that we do not really care about what's happening of the, in the Philippines, right? We do not care about our economy. We do not care about online sexual exploitation of children because we are so inward looking. And we're so convicted with this because God delights in righteousness and justice. And so if it deals with righteousness and justice, we should engage ourselves in those things. In other words, we have to care about the issues of our day. That's one thing we need to grow. But in church, God still delights that his people live in righteousness. And because God delights that his people would live in righteousness, we will continue to exercise discipline. And because God is a God who is, good, who is a good God and he disciplines us because he is good, we continue to call us to submit to discipline. But even as we are in discipline, we continue to exhort one another to cling on to Christ because our sin does not nullify what Christ has done in the cross of Calvary. These things God still delights. But more than these things, I want to emphasize today on the proclamation of the gospel where the steadfast love, justice, and righteousness of God come in perfect harmony so that when we look at the cross, it is not confusion that we see. It is beauty and glory. God delights in the gospel of Christ because it is there in the gospel that this displays the fullness of his beauty. So that if we know God and he delights in Christ, we too delight. We too delight in Christ. We too will boast in Christ and its proclamation. You see, everything flows from knowing and treasuring Christ. Everything boils down to it. We could not content ourselves with making sure that we are rightly doing the practical things in life and ministry without making sure that Christ is the treasure of our hearts because the treasure of our hearts will determine our response to every God-given circumstance. So if we truly know God, it cannot be that he will not be our boast. Because if we do know him, we would have known already in our hearts that he is infinitely more valuable than those things that you see as important. He is supremely valuable. So, and there are practical challenges that we face. We sometimes go around for solutions, but sometimes why is it that we have done all the practical solution already, but all of these solutions prove futile? And we realize many times that it is not about the practical things. The problem is our hearts. You tried reading already, tried to put your disciplines, your alarm clock in the morning. You tried doing all these things, thinking that these practical things will solve the problem. But unless you search your heart and realize the idols of your heart so that you can repent before God and ask the Lord for grace, you will continue in what you're doing. I believe seeking to know if Christ is still the treasure of our hearts, of your heart, could be the most practical thing to do. Because only then can you expect that your life will change if he is your treasure. So today, as we start this new journey together in this beautiful place, it is good. It is good to search our hearts and know if Christ is still our treasure.